you've got a lot to do. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little less on your mind? I'd Bailey can take the pressure off your day-to-day -day accounting, taxes, data issues, and other business needs. What inspires you inspires us. This is the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast brought to you by Art Wiederman, CPA with Eid Bailey. Whether it's taxes and investing or planning wisely, Art is the expert to make your dental practice profitable. At Eid Bailey, what inspires you inspires us. We provide a suite of accounting and advisory services dedicated to the total care of your practice. Visit our website to access our tools and resources tailored for dentists, eidbailey.com slash dentist. That's E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com slash dentist. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Art Wiederman, CPA, and Ide Bailey, LLP are not rendering legal, accounting, or other professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information or opinions shared. If you have questions and or feedback, make sure to email Art over at awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A-W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com. You can also give Art a call at 657-279-3243. Without further delay, here's your host, Dental CPA, Art Wiederman. And hello, everyone, and welcome to another and very exciting edition of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman, CPA. I'm your host, Art Wiederman. Welcome to my podcast that has now entering its fifth year. I can't believe it. I mean, I wonder that when this is over, when I get to my fifth year, like, you know, when you've hosted Saturday Night Live five times, you get a five timers jacket. I don't know if I'm going to get one of those, but uh, uh, well, there's nobody to give it to me. But if anybody wants to send me a five timers jacket, I'd love to have it or five year anniversary as we're going to be coming up at the end of this year. And the reason I say this is exciting because I have one of my dearest friends in dentistry who is my guest today. Uh, Deborah Engelhart Nash is a national dental management lecturing teaching treasure. That's all I can tell you. Uh, I met Deborah uh, when I was with the Pacific Institute of Management in 1984 when I started. Uh, when I knew her as simply Engelhart and not Deborah Engelhart Nash. Uh, 27 years ago, she married uh, Dr. Ross Nash, who is one of the most prominent uh, cosmetic aesthetic dentists in the world. And Deborah will tell you a little about, about the Nash Institute, which if you don't know about it, you should. Uh, and I attended Deborah's course when I was speaking last summer at the Academy of General Dentistry meeting. And Deborah's course was on case presentation. And I I've been a dental CPA for 38 years. I know enough to be dangerous, but I'll tell you what, she is golden. She is spot on. And we're going to focus today on Deborah's eight rules for increasing treatment acceptance. And folks, let me say this, and I've said this from my pulpit for on lecture stages all over the country, on the podcast, to my clients for 38 years. When you go to dental conventions or dental meetings, if you go to CDA, ADA, Hinman, Dallas, wherever you're going to go, your state meeting, make sure that while clinical dentistry is very, very important, that you find courses on how to speak and talk and communicate with your patients because that's what it's all about. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I will get to Deborah in a moment. Uh, just a couple of announcements uh, a thank you again to my wonderful marketing partner, Decisions in Dentistry magazine, www.decisionsindentistry.com. They have incredible clinical content, 140 continuing education courses for very, very reasonable prices. And we've got a lot of new, exciting things on the business end that we're doing with Decisions in Dentistry magazine, which we'll be telling you about as we go along here in 2023. So make sure you check out their website, www.decisionsanddentistry.com. Um, for those of you in Northern California, we are doing wonderful lecture programs for younger dentists who are trying to figure out what is it that you guys want to do when you grow up? Do you want to own a practice? Do you want to be a partner in a practice? Do you want to work for one of the large uh, uh, dental companies out there. What what do you want to do? Well, we've got you covered. 
So you might make a note that June 10th, we're going to be in the Bay Area. We don't have the location nailed down yet. It's either going to be probably East Bay-ish, but we're not 100% sure. And that is June 10th. And then on June 22nd, we'll be in Sacramento, and that location is still being finalized. But we want you to go on to the CDA's website, cda.org, and sign up for those courses, June 10th, June 22nd. If you need more information, uh, let me know. Uh, my phone number is 657-279-3243, and my email is awiederman at idebailey.com. I am a proud dental division director at the CPA firm of Ide Bailey. I know I talk about, and you guys are probably sick of hearing, but it's getting nasty out there regarding this employee retention tax credit. Uh, we are hearing from the state societies, from the national societies, uh, from our clients that it, it has almost become a boiler room situation. And I actually saw a YouTube video last week, which absolutely abhorred me. And that is a word, abhorred or abhor, I guess, whatever it is. It made me really mad. And it was a young person who was on YouTube talking about how easy it was to, as I put it in his words, do this side hustle of getting people to do the ERTC. It's easy. It's not a big deal. And you can make tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars by signing up uh, these people for this ERTC. This is where this is going. I have another client who got a notice in the mail that had his name and address of his practice and an amount of $162,000 on it saying, this is your ERTC. And it looked just like an IRS notice. And he emailed me and said, Art, is this real? Am I getting this? So folks, here's what I'm going to tell you. If you get phone calls from these companies and they just tell you to go online and fill out a form and you're going to get this money, don't fall for it. Talk to your CPA, talk to your financial advisor. We at the Academy of Dental CPAs, 25 CPA firms across the U.S. that represent over 10,000 dentists. Uh, and I'm proud to say that my friend Deborah, who you'll hear from shortly, is coming to speak at our meeting for the first time uh, in May. That's exciting to me. Um, and and so, you know, talk to one of them, www.adcpa.org, or call me. If you are being pressured by people or all your friends are saying they did it and you feel like you're missing the boat, you're not missing the boat because many of you were not, I repeat, not shut down by government orders. Um, and and you, you probably don't qualify for the ERTC. So I just want to put that warning out there for you. So be, be aware of that. Also, last thing before we get to Deborah, uh, I will be at uh, I will be speaking, giving three different talks at the California Dental Association. Uh, I believe that is May 17th to the 19th. Um, in Anaheim, California, at the Anaheim Convention Center. We will be at booth 1472. Please come by and say hi. I would love to see all of you. Be sure to check out our new Ide Bailey podcast, Ebb and Flow, a business podcast providing inspired insight on issues and trends the middle market faces. Hear unique business stories, get answers to frequently asked and unasked questions, and understand business topics that matter to you. Available now on your favorite podcast platform. All right. Well, this is the quietest that Deborah Engelhart Nash has ever been. Uh, she has not spoken now for five or six minutes. She's, she's. <laughs> I know she's exploding and ready to. She, 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 she. Her head's coming off. Um, joking aside, Deborah Hart Engelhart Nash is the co-founder of the Nash Institute uh, and is a practice management expert. And I have no problem saying she's an expert. Um, she practice management consultant, seminar leader. Throughout her career, Deborah has worked in hundreds of dental offices, evaluating teams and practice development, day-to-day -day operations, and offering creative solutions for communications, effectiveness, and increased productivity. She writes and lectures internationally on practice management and team building. She's been an instructor for the Central Piedmont Community College Dental Assisting Program in Charlotte, North Carolina. She's taught for Oregon Health Science University Continuing Dental Education Department. She has repeatedly presented programs for the ADA and probably every single dental meeting you've ever heard of. 
Um, she is a founding member and served two terms as the president of the National Academy of Dental Management Consultants, where she received the first Charles Kidd Meritorious Service Award and is on the board of the ADA Association Foundation. And I must call you now, dear Madam President, because you are now the incoming president of the Academy for Private Dental Practice, formerly known as the American Academy for Dental Practice. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to fall over. I can't introduce you anymore. Uh, Welcome. Yes, I recently installed as the, as the president. Yeah. Did, did you have like a, a gala ball where you dressed up and got to dance with Ross in you front know, of cameras? I got a nice, no, actually Ross, it, th there's a whole situation that happened during Chicago in winter and Ross was home recovering from. I know, I heard that. And, yeah, and that sort of thing. But no, it was a nice, it was a very nice installation luncheon. And um, it was a great announcement for our 2024 meeting. Uh, I've been a member of that organization for 23 years, I think. Okay. And tell us about the organization. The um, American, the it's no longer the American because we you can be international now. So the Academy for De, uh, for Private Dental Practice was actually founded in 1957, which, by the way, was the year that the high speed handpiece was debuted. Is that and right? And bubble wrap, yes. And the, and oh, the I love bubble wrap. Uh, bubble wrap, nineteen. It's my favorite. I pop bubble wrap whenever I can. Yeah, I like to you know pop it. So, uh, it was a group of dentists, private practice dentists, who said, um, "Hey, let's get together and talk about our businesses and how can we make them better and how can we help each other with situations of you know regarding employment and team and costs and you know building our building our practices and so." It was almost, it was like a mentorship organization that really, truly grew. And in the and it was by invitation only. When I say invitation only, because I remember these days, and you remember some of my friends, Andrea Klassen and oh, dear. Um, Pam Struther. My, my big you sisters get, in dentistry. Yes. You would get an uh, basically an, an engraved invitation to attend that meeting. So wow. it was by, it's truly by invitation only. Now they've relaxed that. They've become less. Um, uh, discriminating. I won't even say, I, you know, uh, about it. So, um, so it was the AADPA, and then it was the AADP. They dropped administration because people always thought it was all about practice management, but there are actually seven pillars to the organization, which I'll talk about. So we have adopted the the new name, the Academy for Private Dental Practice. We want people to know that this is a niche organization or a niche organization, if I wanted to be French, for dentists who are or who want to who either want to maintain private practice or be in private practice um, and don't want to go into the DSO world. Not saying DSO world is bad. It's just no, different. It's, it's different. different. It's different. So when you take a look at and you mentioned um, your programs, I, which I think are awesome, I heard a statistic last week that um, private practice dentistry is shrinking by 7% per year. That that could be, but, but I'll tell you, this is an interesting conversation before we get into case presentation. Yeah. I know that medicine is 98, 99% PPO, HMO, capitation, big corporations, okay? But, I mean, you and I have been in this business 40 years, right? And right. there are, I think, enough dentists out there who are going to look at this and say the private fee for service practice of dentistry must be maintained must go on to the next generation and 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 yes right now i think the statistic is is maybe 25 to 30 percent of dentistry right now is some sort of group practice yeah, or DEO. Yeah, or DEO, DS. Yeah, I mean, big. The, you have the big ones. That there's 200, 300, 400 groups, and there are groups emerging, and it, it's a big deal, okay? And it's not something that you and I dealt with at the Pacific or Pride Institute. And and, yeah. and there is a place, and we're not going to get into that discussion today, but, but don't you think, Deborah, that there is groups like yours need to be known about? They need to be, you know, uh, nourished and fed and because that is where dentists are happier. They're providing better service to their patients, better total health coaching, right? I think, you know, it's interesting that you, that you mentioned this. I think that's true. I think it's a different, 
Uh, for some, for some, it's okay. What is your personality? Um, is and what is your strength of con- of commitment and conviction for the kind of dentistry that you do? We had a young dentist. We do we offer scholarships to um, the uh, APDP, the Academy for Private Dental Practice, to doctors who have been out five years or less. So we can offer scholarships, and I I granted two scholarships this year. Nice. And one one of the doctors. Um, is working for a very large group. I mean, 16 operatories, four doctors, eight hygienists, crazy. Yeah. And yeah. I said to him, I don't want to mention his first name because it's no. unique enough that people say, oh, I know who you're talking about. And I said, um, so tell me what, what, you're, what you're working on. And he said, my speed. Uh, my speed. My speed. I get faster. Uh, I said, wait a minute. What about, what about, um, faster, or do we want to be more effective? So there's there's a dilemma, and this kind of segues into treatment presentation. Is it how many patients that I see, or is it what I'm doing per patient that's important? Um, I was just in an office this morning, and I was conducting their team meeting, and we talked. We took a look at that 44 new patients, and I said that's a great number. Depending. Yeah. On what you did with those 44 patients. So we actually have to really break that down. So because sometimes and you do this because you talk about metrics. Art. Right. So sometimes offices say, oh, we had 44 new patients and they get all excited. And I always say, but wait, wait, first of all, you had 44, you, you acquired 44 new patients. What was your attrition? Did you lose mm-hmm. any? What was your attrition rate? I just wrote an article on that. Yeah. And what was the value of each one of those 44 patients? Because do you want 44 patients who come in with and you present uh, and and a uh, $400 treatment plan is accepted? Or would you rather have 22 patients who come in and you present a $4,000 treatment plan and a $4,000 treatment plan is accepted? Oh, you are so good at Segway. Do you ride a Segway, by the way? I don't know. <laughs> so I think that that's, you know, for for the for young doctors who are trying to decide, and that is why the um, the Academy for Private Dental Practice is perfect for doctors who are trying to navigate uh, what I want to do. And I understand. I was talking to a, a professor um, from the University of Nebraska. He said, "Hey, we get it. They come out of debt. I mean, they come out of school with a whole lot of debt. And the question is, do they come out with this school debt?" And then they go into more debt by opening a private practice or buying uh, a private practice. But then you also have to take a look at what is my, and you're, you're the master at this art. What is my earning? What's the differential of my earning potential being a corporate dentist or being a private practice dentist? It's it's, it's night and day. Yeah. What's my long-term earning potential? And and just being, being not having people tell you what to do. You are your own. What, what was it at Seinfeld? You're the master of your own domain. Is that what it was? I don't know. I'm I don't know. I'm a Seinfeld person. Oh, but I, I was. Think the I important am. thing is, yes, um, I have a yeah. client who started with a, a DSO and he absolutely, I mean, he said the regional and I'm not, once again, no, not dedicated, no, no, but no, the, no. Regional, the regional director would make the rounds come to to his office and she said you need to change labs because you're paying too much for your, for your um your laboratory fees so you need to use this lab and you need to and you need to do this so now we've got a regional director dictating his clinical treatment yep and he said that's when i said you know what you can talk to me about management you can talk to me about a uh, team and you but when a regional director who's not a dentist is, tell, is telling me is dictating my treatment for, to my patients based on cost based on how can we reduce the cost of you doing this dentistry? He said, that's when I knew that I was not in the right place. And now he's in private practice dentistry. And now he has three associates and he has two locations. And he did that in like five years. And he's happy. He's happy. And he's He's happy. happy. He go, he doesn't throw up every day for his work. Okay. So So. real quick before, because I want to get into your eight rules. um, And we'll be lucky if we get through one of them, you and I, right? It's really terrible. How does someone find out? Is there a website? Is there? Uh, and I'm going to let you give out your contact information okay. here. Well, there is a. There is. We actually are now just converting our website over to the new name, so people still find the uh, uh, academy under aadp.org. So it's still listed uh, American Academy of Dental Practice. 
Uh -huh. um, we haven't converted the website yet, but if you go on to AADP, uh, and we're just getting ready to post, we just finished having the 2023 meeting. So now we're posting our meeting in 2024, which is March 7th through the 9th in Coral Springs, Fort Lauderdale. Nice. Um, great, they have good golf courses there. Good golf courses there. And a great, uh, I have a great program chair for the year. And she has put together an amazing, amazing program. Uh, very, very briefly, because I have I have my eight rules, but I also have the, the academy has seven pillars. And that's sort of when we design our meetings and when, when, when the organization was designed. They basically said, these are sort of the seven pillars of um, a well-rounded, comprehensive uh, dental office. And it's uh, based on clinical aptitude. So there's always a clinical, some clinical training, uh, mentorship. You know, we collaborate, we talk to one another. How are you doing this? How are you, how are you handling that? There's a woman, oh, I mean, she's amazing. And I'll say, her name is Dr. Mary Rock. And she is 58 years old. And she's just opened her practice, a startup. She just opened a startup practice. She At left 58, 58 years old. Wow. And God she bless is her. So excited. God and so bless she, her. She has gotten a lot of information from coming to that meeting and saying, okay, who are you using for this? And who's doing your website? And how are you doing this? And how are you handling this? And so, so mentorship is important. Leadership is, um, we, you know, we talk about leadership because I think uh, strong dental practices have strong leadership. Leadership doesn't have to be loud. I'm going to write an article about that, about that. Leadership does not have to be loud. That doesn't mean you are gregarious and you are a cheerleader. And, um, there's very strong leadership that's very quiet. Le but, leadership but, is another podcast you and I need to do. But, I know, um, we talk about leadership. Uh, new, the new pa uh, patient experiences, that's one of the pillars. So we have clinical, mentorship, leadership, patient experiences, business, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And um, culture is another one, um, and finance. So yep. those are we think these are the seven pillars of. I mean, if you're going to build a dental practice, you've got to have these things well in place, and that's what we work well, on, and that's what our national meetings are all about. Well, I'm excited for you and your organization, and I Thanks. would encourage all of you to check out the Academy for Private Dental Practice or it's the a, uh, it's, Academy it's of. Design. It's not a large group. It's you know we're not trying to get to. Uh, thousands of people. I mean, like uh, they just had the women in DSO meeting. They were like 950 yeah. people. Yeah. I yeah. think AOSH is 1,500 members. We like to keep it um, niche-like, boutique-like. Uh, we actually do a lot of social things. Uh, people bring their uh, their significant others, and we always have an activity for significant others so that they can talk together and they collaborate. They have a women's a women in dentistry mastermind group. So. We like to keep it um, family oriented, if you will. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't. That doesn't mean we don't swear. But we. <laughs> <laughs> you can't swear on my podcast, but we, we'll, I know, we'll swear I know. if I ever get to one of your meetings. I I might, I might swear. Yeah, we had. I'll darn. Tell you. See, there I go. I said darn. Okay. Yeah. So there we. I'll <laughs> tell you, there was an exceptional speaker at this last meeting that. Oh my gosh, his name is Dr. Darren Pretzel. If you ever have a chance, I'm going to just a shout out for him oral surgeon. He was a oral surgeon in Iraq. And he, I mean, he talks wow. about, oh, about his whole story is not just Iraq, but it's also about uh, being a private practice oral surgeon. I, it's just an am amazing, inspirational, tear jerking, but heartfelt, motivating program. And that's right. what, that is what the APDP is all about. It is all yeah. about inspiring you to go back to your practices and be better and do better and have better. Um, be more productive, be more well, effective, be more, I, and be happy. Be I happy. Wish, yes, yes. I wish you luck as your Thanks. president, your tenure. So I want to read something from your eight rules. Let's get into our topic. Okay. Because uh, this is one way or another going to turn into a seven-hour podcast. What does it take <laughs> to get a yes to treatment from your patients? There is no quick fix, magic wand, or potion that will give you the treatment success you're dreaming for. The difference between success and failure is not a single secret, but it is a secret formula. There is a series of eight critical principles that will lead you to success. Some of these are fundamental steps that successful salespeople and entrepreneurs have been executing for centuries. They are attributes that high achievers have in common. So do you, um, uh, since you're the defendant here, would you like to make an open, I mean, uh, the council, would you like what to make an open statement? Oh my or gosh, do you, I feel like uh, you just caught 
a video of me in the dog kennel. I mean, I'm <laughs> 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 uh, okay. So well, you, let's just, you want to just jump into the rules here? Well, here's why well, I will say this. Um, a lot of, I'm going to give a couple of really important points, pointers from the get go. And then we, we can back up to sure. it. Sure. 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 Um, one of the one of the ways the dentists sabotage presenting treatment to patients is they start with let me tell you what you need. Uh huh. And I mean that's 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 a that's a sabotage um, yep. because patients aren't don't become interested in being bombarded with being either scolded right. or lectured to about what their treatment needs are. So I always say to my clients, you know, when you're getting ready to sit down with a patient to talk about your findings, ask permission. Yep. Uh, you know, so it's like, so, you know, when we talk about you know, communication, communicate, and we'll, we'll get into that. So the, the, the opening question for presenting treatment is, um, would you allow me to tell you what I'd like to do for you? Or would you allow me to tell you what is possible? Would you allow me to tell you what I would like to do if you were my sister? Would you allow me to tell you what I have found as opposed to, I'm going to tell you what you need. And here's what oftentimes happens as well. So when we talk about the rules, I mean. No, no, you, you, you have carte blanche to talk about, this is all great stuff. That's that's a critical, I think that's a critical piece that we sit down and and, and it actually, we even back up to, and we won't go into a phone call today, but oftentimes a new patient calls the office and you say, okay, you're going to have a new patient examination and we're going to do x-rays and study models and all kinds of screening exam. We're going to do periodontal probings, which sounds scary. We're going to do blah, 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 blah. We're going to create a treatment plan for you. We're going to tell you what your insurance is going to cover. We're going to tell you what you need and what your out-of-pocket expenses are going to be. Uh, we regurgitate. Uh, we just like a vomit on but, them. In, but in the but Deborah, I just want my teeth cleaned. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Um, you know what? I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to talk about how we do that for you. So yeah. it goes back to. So we you know. So I'm sorry we don't just clean teeth. Or I'm sorry. I mean, I always say, you know, the, if, if you tell somebody they're not going to get what they ask for, you've lost them. So if you said I just want to have my teeth cleaned, I'd be happy to tell you how we can handle that for you, Art. Yeah. Would you allow me to ask you a few questions before I do? Me ask you a few questions. Yep. Yep. So I can go in back into the conversation and I can back that into that. I say, you know, you know, a lot of patients do, a lot of new patients do call us asking to have their teeth cleaned because they haven't experienced what we have to offer. Right. Yeah. Can I tell you a little bit more about what that is? So asking permission we, is huge. Asking permission is huge. And yeah. even asking when you're, when you're gathering information on the telephone, what, you know, may I ask you a few questions as opposed to what's your name, what's your address, what's your social security number? Do you have any, um, um, artificial joints. Do you have to be pre-medicated? Do you have any sexually transmitted diseases? Do you, I mean, we start asking some very personal questions and we don't even get, we don't even know these people. We don't we know. Don't we don't know, know what their hot buttons are. We don't know what their life looks like. Exactly. Oh my God. Oh my so God. So I think we have to say, you okay. know, I want to make sure that we schedule most appropriately for you and, and you're going to have the most exceptional experience you've ever had in a dental office so that I can accomplish that for you. May I ask you a few questions? Right. And the and, first question we ask is not name, number, what insurance do you have? I have to back up to that because so many times you call me and you say, my name is Art and I have my teeth clean. Oftentimes the first question is, Art, what, what a dental insurance do you have? And I spend 10 minutes talking to you about your exclusions, your, your out-of-pocket expenses, your deductible, your rules and regulations of your dental, pra- of your dental insurance. And then we wonder why the patients want to talk about dental insurance. We brought it up. We brought it up. We're training them. We're, we're, we're training, training them. them. That dental insurance is the focal point. So I think it's important that the most important question we ask, I would ask you, Art, you know, so I want to have my teeth cleaned. Art, happy to talk to you about a little bit about that before I do may ask you a few questions. And my right. one of my questions for you, Art, would be tell me what inspired you to call our office. What right. was it that in, what was it that inspired you to call us uh-huh. or call today? Because today you wanted to make a decision in your dental, you want to make a change in your dental life. And I need to find out what that what what it was that inspired you to call me. So that starts that whole process. Right. You got to get them in. The number one thing that that you've taught me, Andrea, Pam, all the people at Pride, get them into the office. You got to get them in. They, you can't you can't do dentistry on people that are not in your office. So well, and you you have to you have to create the differential. You have right. You have about fifteen seconds yep. to show the patient that you're different that you are different. So I, I think that's really also yeah. important. I think what's also critical uh, for dentists when we talk about eight, the, you know, the eight rules, 
the number one rule is believe you can do the treatment. Yeah. And yeah, believe, that's the first one. And believe that the patients want it because so many times, oh, and this happens so many times, especially with patients of record. The patient isn't interested. The patient can't afford it. The patient's too old. The patient's too young. The patient doesn't want it. Their insurance isn't going to cover it. We create all of these roadblocks, our own roadblocks. So the first thing we have to do is we have to we have to eliminate those scotomas in our head, those roadblocks we created. They don't want it. They're not interested. Insurance is going to cover right. it. They're too poor. They can't afford it. Address. Yeah. I mean, there are a whole lot of people. And I'm not going to make any discriminating remarks, but there are a whole, I mean, I live near a um, major shopping mall. I'm not a big shopper, but you know, if I have to go, I have to go. If I have to go pick something up, but when I go there, there is a Gucci store and a Louis Vuitton store and the, and a Tiffany that it's, um, oh, what's the raincoat from England? For, um, starts with oh, a B. I don't know. You know famous I don't wear rain. People. I don't wear raincoats from England. Uh, yeah. You're in California. So the rain. <laughs> oh, it's people, raining right now, dear. Uh, oh, Burberry. So there's Burberry. Burberry. Okay. Louis Vuitton, Tiffany's, and Gucci, and they're all kind of uh, these four pillar stores in this mall. There is a line in each one of. The, there's a line to get into each one of these stores. There's yeah. a line. There's a reason. There's well, there's a reason because buying one of those items makes me feel good about me. And there's never a conversation about what Louis Vuitton insurance do you have? There's never a question about what Burberry or Tiffany insurance do you have? It's all about, let me show you how this is going to make you feel. And that's what we have to do in dentistry as opposed to here's what you need. And here's the other thing that happens. We apologize. You know, so you come to me, Art, and you have a tooth that's fractured or you have an old restaurant, you know, you have like a 17 uh, surface pin build up that's you know finally uh broken down and we have to and i and i apologize i say oh art i'm so sorry but we can't we can't replace that filling there's too much uh natural tooth surface gone you're gonna need a crown i'm i'm so sorry we apologize yeah as opposed to saying art oh my gosh i have great news we have a solution for what the problem you brought to me Uh uh-huh we we yeah. yeah, there's a solution to this. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna lose that tooth. We're not gonna have to do anything dramatic. I, you know, we were gonna take a radiograph or we're gonna take digital images. Or we're gonna see that um, everything underneath is sound. But we and we have a solution for how we're gonna and, protect that top. And, and when we're done with you, you are gonna look amazing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're talking about you know cosmetics and aesthetics. But even so, here's the other thing that when we have to when we're talking about presenting treatment. For me, I always tell my my clients, everything is elective. You know, you say, well, this patient needs a crown. No, they don't. No, they don't. They don't need it. And They have 31 other teeth. (laughs) Yeah. And so we have to say, well, you need need this. No, but you know what? Can I tell you why I think this would be in your best interest? This would be the best solution for you because not you need a crown. We were just talking about this today. This office was working with patients who want to refuse radiographs. And we were we were walking through conversations about you know radiograph refusal. Well, the same thing about dental refusal. We we also have a tendency to say, here's what we can do for you, but, and the minute I the minute the patient hears but, they forgot everything you just said. They want right. to they want to hear what's happening after the but. Right. Which sounds kind of weird, but <laughs> um, you know <laughs> they say we can do this for you, but. You only have a thousand dollars insurance allowance. Oh, you just killed the whole thing. You just killed the whole thing. Yeah, killed the whole thing. So everything I said before that, because what you just basically said is, it's okay to say no. You just gave the patient permission right. to say no. But you gave them an out. You gave them an out. So yeah. what you can turn around and say is, um, actually, you know, this is an interesting statistic. Fifty percent of Americans have have some level of dental insurance. Right. So I always say, you know, yeah. not everybody. We, and, and so people who are listening to this say, yeah, they're all in my office and they all want to know what insurance is going to cover. And if I'm in network and if I, you know, if I participate in their plan. But here's what we can say is you are so lucky that your employer has provided a dental allowance for you. Exactly. It make it, it you're lucky. It's a dental benefit. It's not insurance. It's, it's no, a dental. It's, not a, it's benefit, a benefit. It's a dental allowance. So I think we have to let the patient know your employer has provided a dental allowance. They have determined how much they are willing to allot for your dental care. And it was never designed to cover all costs. Right. 
So we always say, you know, we will do our best to help you. And I always also say, we'll do our, uh, we're going to do our best to help you utilize the dental allowance that has been provided for you by your employer. Exactly. However, we are not going to compromise our standard of care based on the exceptions, limitations, or restrictions of any plan. Exactly. I love yeah. that. That that's yeah. cool. So number one is believe you can go. You I can. mean, I mean, one of the things that I talk to doctors about is become an outstanding clinician. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I mean, take courses. And again, you know, obviously your institute is as good as it gets. But wherever they're going to go, wherever you know, Spear, yeah. Panky, Koi, Nash, wherever it is. Just continue to learn, continue to be, what was it, uh, Bill, and, uh, Bill and Ted's excellent, excellent adventure? Be excellent, right? Yeah, That's excellent. what we want them to do. You know, the other thing is, and, and I might be a little bit um, uh, happily biased after hearing Dr. Pretzel, the oral surgeon, speak. And, you know, know, what, know what's in your wheelhouse and know when to refer out. Right. Because I see a lot, of, a lot of dentists who try to 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 do a, a procedure and and it's it's laborious for them and so like, what get really good at some some things don't you don't have to get good at everything and right. actually I'm a big fan of of outsourcing when you can I was I was again uh, Dr Pretzel said I can take out four wisdom teeth in three to six minutes can a general dentist do that no nope. can't do that so the patient's going to have a better experience. I mean, if the day, if it's easy to to whiz the thing out, you know, great. But if the patients can have a better dental experience somewhere else, help them find that somewhere else. So when they come back to you and say, "Oh my gosh, that was an amazing patient experience," I we just referred a patient. Um, my husband's practice referred a patient to a periodontist, and in in order to um, to increase um, to expedite uh, healing, he actually takes the patient's blood and, and does the whole. Um, spinning thing and guts the platelets and puts it back into the tissue to heal. How many general dentists do that? Nope. They don't. So I think no. So when I say believe you can, be careful that you don't have to be an expert in all things, but you can have experts around you who can help you be a better dentist. It's the same thing in my profession. It's the same thing as an attorney or an architect or anything. All right. Intention, Deborah. Okay. What's intention? intention. Yeah. So the intention is, um, you know, make sure that you share what is the purpose of your practice? What is your intention? And I always tell you, there, now I've actually, since I've written this article, there's even more reasons about intentional. Intentional body language means how I sit when I'm talking to a patient. So if I'm, if I'm intentionally, I mean, if I'm intentionally listening to you, Art, I'm going to be leaning slightly forward. I'm going to be, we're going to have eye contact. That says I'm, I'm intentionally a paying, I'm a paying attention to you and I'm intentionally listening to what you have to say. But I also think it's also when you talk about intention, when I talk about intentional, does your team understand what you're trying to accomplish? Can your team describe your purpose to the, to the patient? Because one of the other pieces down here is team involvement. Yep. yep. That's it's number three. Absolutely critical for the team to understand the doctor's intention the practice's intention, so that I can articulate that to the patient. And here's the, the, the little weird little marketing phrase. My responsibility as a dental assistant, as receptionist, treatment coordinator, hygienist, is to create the perception of quality remote from doctor's presence. See, and my question, Deborah, is what happens when the doctor presents the treatment and leaves the room and the patient says to the assistant, well, do it. Do you really think I need that? Yeah, or, gee, or, or here's what they say. We talked about this this morning in my group. Um, wow, that sounds expensive. Yeah. So, so we have to make sure that the team understands. Now, here's the other piece. If we back way, way up, if I'm the treatment coordinator, or the dental assistant, or the hygienist, whatever the the uh, format is in the particular practice, how the new patient comes into the office, there should be a story before we launch into radiographs. And x-rays before we launch into our mechanics, people need to understand the why. And that's why I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek and the book Start With Why. Most yep. you know, doctors need to read that. People, your patients want to know your why. That's your intention. And the team needs to say, My name is Deborah, and I look and I have worked for Dr. Wiederman for 38 years. Can I tell you why I've been here so long? Because I have found throughout the years 
that he has an amazing in integrity. He's got a strength of character. He absolutely loves his patients. He's an, an advocate for continuing education. And even though he's been a dentist all this time, he continues to grow and learn to provide his patients in the best technology. He treats me with great respect. And, and for that, I really admire. So sometimes patients will ask me, does he pay, does he pay me to tell you this? I said, you know, he pays me to be here. But for what I've just told you, he earned that. He earned my respect and my regard. I mean, right. And, and and I wouldn't have, and I would not have anybody else do any dental treatment on me, my family, or my friends. Yeah. He is as good as it gets. And if if he says that you need that, this is it, then you can take that to the bank. I mean, Absolutely. really, yeah. So, all right. so, now, so, so, and once again. The patient, the, the team members must, that has to be an authentic feeling. Yes. So I can't say if I don't believe it. So there's a believable factor. If I don't believe it, I can't say it. And if I don't believe it, yeah. maybe I'm in the wrong place. Right. And, th and that comes back to culture and that comes back to the leader, the doctor treating the team with respect and not like aid servants. And, and, and really, I mean, because would you, if you were a dental assistant, Deborah, and that, and the doctor would berate you all the time and be mean to you all the time, how difficult would it be for you when that question comes up from the patient to say what you just said, right? I know if I don't feel validated, if I don't feel important, it's hard for me to endorse my employer. Um, yep. so it would be hard for me to go and say, I, you know, I'm happy to be here and this is the, like the best place for me to be. And this work is impeccable. That's the other thing. I have to feel that the work is impeccable, which goes to the next rule. There has to be education. So Knowledge. the patient, the, the team, in fact, um, the office, you know, my husband just sold, he sold his practice last year and we're taking the team through the whole, from analog to digital. So the team is doing two days of training on digital technology. You know, we can't just throw the, the, the team into a, hey, guess what? We're going to now start doing uh, 3D printing and we're done, and the team doesn't know what, what we're talking about. The right. team hasn't been educated. So there is an investment involved for to educate the, the team so that they in turn can educate the patient and endorse the treatment. So if I'm not educated, then I can't then I can't educate the patient and the and, and I can't validate the practice if I can educate the patient. So education and taking time to whether you bring in a coach or you bring in a consultant or you take the team to a continued education event, um, it's critical for your team to learn, to learn. Uh, okay, um, I so, think about this, think about, go oh ahead, my gosh, go Art, we've been in dentistry for so long. I remember the day, I mean, I was, I was a pretty good front office person and I, I was pretty savvy. I got recruited out of an audience by, uh, Pacific Institute to, to be a consultant. I remember that story. Yes. Yeah. And I knew, I knew systems, but back in the day, the systems were, uh, we had a, you know, we had an appointment book that was paper and it was like 36 inches long. And we had week at a glance and we wrote in pencil and we had safeguard. Was, we had uh, safeguard. Yeah, I was really good at that. We had ledgers. Yeah. I was really good at that. But if I said, you know, I'm really good at this and I don't need to learn anything new because I'm really good at this, I would be obsolete. I would be, I would have been absolutely obsolete. Yeah. So, and so, I mean, here I is, I'm married to, um, he'll, he's going to kill me. I'm married to a 75 year old dentist who's practicing three days a week. He sold his, his practice and he is as excited about dentistry and technology and about digital um, opportunities and about growing as he was when um, when he started being a cosmetic dentist back in the in the late sixties, early seventies. Yep. Um, so you've got if you stop, you know what I say. You know uh, when you stop growing, you start dying. So I think yeah, it's exactly. important to to constantly get your team excited about learning new, and that's not necessarily just technology, not simply just um, product, but it's also learning new ways to to communicate with the patients. I mean, we can. We don't even have time to talk about social media. No, but, we don't. I, mean, I wish we did. We uh, yeah, but if you're talking about, you know, what do your patients want most now? Do they want to? Do they want a phone call? Do they want to be text? Do they want to text? Do they want to be emailed? Um, do they want a pigeon? What do they want? They want, <laughs> you know, they want it fast. Right. So 
a so different world than when you and I grew up. Yeah. Back in the day, we were like calling patients to val- to to verify their appointment times. Hi. On the rotary Sandra. phone, where you dial the yeah. phone, right? Hi, yeah. Art. I'm just calling to remind you of an appointment on Tuesday at three. I mean, my gosh, we spent half a day calling to verify appointments. De- Deborah, one of my favorite things when I speak to dental schools. I keep an old copy of the yellow pages in my bottom drawer in my kitchen and I bring it with me and I say, so now we're going to talk about marketing. How many of you have ever seen this? And I hold up the yellow page. I say, this is the yellow pages. And the fun part is to watch their faces because they don't know what that is. So it's, (laughs) it's very, very different. Hey, Hey, I want to get to some more stuff. Tell me if people want to get a hold of you. Tell, tell me a little bit about the Nash Institute. Tell me a little bit about what you do, and let's give out some contact information if someone oh, wants to give you a call. Okay. Sure. Well, the Nash Institute for Dental Learning, we started that. Um, and my gosh, we were talking about this. We started that in uh, 1997. Uh, it's a continue. It's a postgraduate continuum, and it it's, was designed that it could be taken a la carte. You don't have to take the whole continuum, but you could also, you could take it whenever you want, however you want. But Ross designed it to be, uh, ideally, to be taken with direct restorations. Um, so direct aesthetic, uh, direct aesthetic, so that'd be posterior and anterior. And then um, indirect, so that would be anything that's crown and bridge, inlay, onlay, which today's dental students say, what's an inlay? Um, you know, <laughs> that's amazing um, to me. I, I hear yeah, that too. crowns, veneers. Um, anything that's, you know, lab fabricated or indirect. And then he also does a, a course on full mouth rehabilitation or rejuvenation. So that's his three course continuum. And then we have the dental business school, which is two days of from, and I always say it's from phone call to recall, how you walk the patient through your business systems um, to, first of all, to attract them, to attract and retain and increase your treatment acceptance rate and then move them into recall. Um, and keeping them. So that's kind of dental business school. And that's is there a website that they can get to or a phone number? They can go to the Nash Institute for Dental Learning website. Uh, If they want to call, then it's um, they can call the Nash Institute. They can. But the easiest thing is they can go onto the website and look at the curriculum. Um, If they have any questions on that, they can actually ask their questions on the website. See, that's new technology. We answer right away or they can or they can call us. So, um, but they get all and, the information they need on the site and they can answer, you know, they, they can answer questions on the site as well. And you so, still do consulting in private I offices. I still love to, I'm doing, I'm yep. going into an office tomorrow and Friday to, to work with the front office right. team on languaging and language skills. You want to um, give out, you're the one that's teaching about how to do this. And I'm trying to get you to sell yourself here. And you're know, not doing I a very know. good job, Deborah. I always so, say, you know, if you want me, you'll find me. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's how I used to date too. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I yeah, believe yeah, that. You'll find me. No, I do have a website. In fact, I'm just getting ready. I'm revamping my website now, but I, Deborah Englehart Nash.com. Okay. I have a website. Um, I always give out my cell phone number because I never know where in the country I might be. This time, the best way to reach me is uh, through my cell phone, which is 704-904-3459. You can text me uh, or you can call me. I don't have a meter on my telephone. I've rare, very rarely had anybody abuse my time. No. Um, so um, I'm, well, I'm willing to ask to answer any questions and talk about my services and, and, and what I do. Absolutely. Uh, okay, because I, I I wish I could make this a three-hour podcast. Empathy, dear. What is empathy in case presentation? Empathy means that what matters to you most is how the patient is receiving what you're saying, not how not that you're saying it. So I think that there's the empathetic response is once again is body language. What is our what is our body saying? Is our body open and is, is, are we, are we paying attention to how the patient is responding? Um, and I think that's important. And now we have to be careful about physical touch for all kinds of reasons. Right. Uh, there was a time that we used to put our, we would put our hand on the patient's, you know, the patient's forearm here and we almost can't do that anymore, but, but our body and our, and our eye contact, eye contact is huge to, uh, demonstrate empathy, uh, to a patient. Um, once again, our body language, I mean, 55% of the way we, we communicate with our patients is in what, what our body's telling them. So I think the way you sit, where you sit in the operatory, 
So that's it, it, that can actually exemplify empathy. Sometimes I go into offices and the doctor and the dental assistant are have their are they are behind the patient's head, and I've got a doctor on one side and I got the dental assistant on the other, and the patients can't even see them. So one of the ways to to demonstrate your empathy is to move yourself forward in front of the patient so they can see you. And actually, if in, in an ideal world, if I have an ideal situation, the dental assistant and the de- dentist are not standing like this. The dental assistant and the dentist are standing like this because now the patient has one focal. They have one focal point. They're looking here. Right. And when I have a dental assistant behind the doctor and the dental assistant is validating, non-verbally validating, when the doctor is saying, here's what I'd like to do for you. Would you allow me to tell you what I could do for you? And the dental and the assistant, and the treatment coordinator, hygienist is behind the dentist saying, yes. And uh, another way of doing that and I have an actual visual of this, is actually if the dental assistant or hygienist has her hand just slightly resting on the doctor's shoulder, what does that say to the patient? I trust trust the guy. I trust the guy. I believe him. And I know, here's another piece, another language that we have to talk about because we can talk about hygienists. We talk about presenting treatment. Because oftentimes we can talk about new patients and we can talk about our our, our eight rules. We'll, We'll get through them. But I also think it's important to take a look at patients of record going through hygiene. And we, and we have to, when we talk about intention and team involvement and education and creating opportunity, that's one of the other rules is creating the opportunity. So many times we have a historical bias that the patient isn't interested, they're too old, they don't want it, they can't afford it, insurance is going to cover it. So we take a look at a treatment plan that had been recommended and, and has not yet been completed. And sometimes we never say anything again to the patient. And sometimes in the morning huddle, we'll say, you know what? I know, I know Art, he, he's not interested in that. He needs some crowns on the upper right side, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to do it. And we go into the hygiene appointment with that theory and we don't bring it up again because we're afraid we're going to offend the patient. Well, if, if we don't bring it up, this goes back to, you know, creating the opportunity. If we don't bring it up, the patient will say, well, I guess it didn't matter. So here is one of the most important questions that a hygienist asks, and it could be anybody, but let's say in the recare uh, department, I have a patient coming to my, to, to my, in my room. I see that they have an outstanding treatment plan, treatment that has, has been uh, planned that has not yet been completed. And I have to ask, and I have not even you should, or you could, I have to ask the patient this question. Art, I see the doctor's recommended treatment that we have yet to be completed, that is yet to be completed. Tell me what has prevented you from having that done. And then I'm gonna then I'm gonna be quiet. Shut up. Shut up. I'm gonna shut up and I wanna and I wanna and I'm gonna once again, my body as I'm leaning forward. I'm not on a computer, I'm not over here distracted, looking at a computer, I'm not behind the patient. I am I'm once again my word intention. I'm intentionally looking at you and saying, Art. This treatment has been was planned for you and has yet to be completed. Tell me what has prevented you from having that taken care of, having that done. And I'm going to be quiet and wait for you to say, I don't need it. It doesn't bother me. I can't afford it. So I think that, you know, when we, we have to walk through, that goes back to also training. That's one of my rules. We have to train the team. So what if the patient says, I can't afford it or it doesn't bother me? We have to, we have to train them to have the, the right answer, not a scripted answer has to be an authentic answer. So let's say the patient says, um, you know, it's just, it's just a lot of money. And I might say, you know, Art, you're right. It, it's, it's significant. Think about if we had done this five years ago when we actually first talked about it, what it would have cost you then and what it will cost you five years from now. So if money is, money is the issue, it will never cost you less than today. Yeah. See, it, it's all about how you phrase it. I mean, they teach... People in all kinds of sales uh, industries and sales jobs, how to do this. This is this is in dentistry. Okay, yeah. number six is enthusiasm. Now you're you're one of the most enthusiastic human beings I've ever met. So oh, why do okay. we need enthusiasm? Well, because it's because it, it, enthusiasm is infectious. Um, it also demonstrates to the patient that once again that that you believe what you're saying. Um, and if, if I come to the patient and, you know, if I'm enthusiastic about what we can offer, if I'm enthusiastic about our new technologies, if I am, if, you know, if I come in with, with the, um, with 
cheerfulness and happiness and enthusiasm, your patient's going to come in with that. If I come in and say, oh, Mrs. Fedevesi, it's so nice to see you. And, um, and, sometimes, and sometimes the patients come in and they may be uh, like a Debbie Downer. I'll use that. Well, then my responsibility is to say, what can I do to make you, to make you have a better day? What can I do to, to, to improve your day today? That's my responsibility. Yep. I want you to be glad that you're here. So we have to be glad that we're that we're that we're at work. I mean, I mean, people say oh, I'd rather be on the beach. Well, yeah, being on the beach would be really nice, but but you're not on the beach, so you're at work. So how do we make the best out of the day? I am convinced that um, I can decide whether or not it's going to be a great day or a bad day, and I'll be right yeah. either way. Yes, and right and, and way. you can make it. Yeah, you can make it whatever you want, and you're going to be dealing with the public that are all different types of people different personalities. You can't fix people's lives. Yes. But yeah. remember again, doctors, again, this is Art Wiederman, the broken record. You <laughs> did. You are not here to fix teeth. You are here to for a better life, a better relationship, a better self-esteem, a better job, and, and a better everything. And that's what you do. And if, if that's what you resonate in your office, then people are probably, Deborah, more likely to buy from you, right? Well, here's the reality. I, and I hate to I hate to burst anybody's bubble. I do not choose your treatment plan based on your clinical aptitude or your clinical abilities. I do not say, "Gee, doctor, could you show me samples of your tertiary anatomy?" Right, right. I, I mean, I let's see your study models. I yeah. will not accept your treatment until I see at least five study models. Yeah, and I'd like to see your and I'd like to see the radiographs, please. I choose. I typically will choose based on the relationship that we develop with one another. I buy from people I like. Let me say that again. I buy from people I like. So, okay, Deborah, in your course, not that I didn't take more away from your two hour course, but the one thing that I take away, and I actually, I have not gotten written permission from you to use this. I just use it. But you yeah. came up with a statistic. Okay, well, you, you and I, you and I are way beyond that. Yes. But okay, you said, and I don't remember, it was something like 77% of the people that leave dental offices leave because they uh, they don't like the doctor and they don't like the team. Actually, you're really that was really a really good retention and actually um um more it's 70 72% of 72% okay 72% of I, I, it's patients, like my golf game well, it's all quoted approximately, you know. 72% <laughs> of leave a practice not because they don't like them because they feel an attitude of indifference. Yeah. They feel like they don't matter anymore. They feel like they're just a recall. It's just Deborah. It you know, or it's just a it's just a patient. They don't feel like they matter enough. 72% of patients don't move forward with, with treatment because they don't feel like they matter enough as a person. I, I mean, you you also in this course and I've heard heard this before but but it really hit home is when the when the um, the person comes out into the uh, the reception area, okay, and and goes and and says now now Deborah, oh hello Deborah, we're re- your room is re- your room that we've set up specially for you is ready, and we are so happy to see. You. How are you? How's your husband? How's Johnny and Susie and and all the other kids? You, I mean, as opposed to when you walk into some healthcare offices, someone opens the door and yells, Nash. Yes. Deborah exactly. Nash. And then yeah. they turn around and they walk away from you like you're supposed to know where to go. Yeah, exactly. That happens some days. Sometimes I, I go to a, a very large um, um, op- optometry, ophthalmology group, and they do that. They stand at the door and they they call my name. And so the, the reception room is huge. And if I didn't, I love the doctor. But and I and, and then they become a little bit more personal. But man, I can start that. I can start making that patient feel special when I actually go to them and say, um, Mr. Wiederman, hi, my name is Deborah. I'll be working with Dr. Nash today in your treatment. We have everything ready for you. We've really been excited to meet you. So that whole, um, as opposed to, are you ready? Or we're ready yeah. for you. So or, how we change that goes back to that um, environment, how we create that environment of um, of welcoming. of welcoming. Yeah. We have to remember, first of all, uh, um, um, we say open wide every day to 20 to 30 patients a day or maybe even more. But to that patient, they're an individual. I mean, so when we take a look at no matter how many patients we see in a day, we got to stop and say, this is 
this patient's experience now. And I can't look at them as just another patient. They've got all kinds of um, phobias and they have questions and I have to make them feel like that they're the only person who matters right if, in this this next 90 minutes. And if you want your patients to refer their friends, you must create that kind of an experience that you care. Absolutely. Yeah, and if we want to take it next, if we want it in today's world where we know Google is king, you know, Google reviews are huge. Right. Um, 85% or almost probably 90% now patients, you know, even though they may have been referred to the practice, they want to read those reviews. So yep. part of you were, you said, oh my gosh, this is some, uh, my question should be to the patient. Tell me about your experience today. And you say, oh my gosh, it was amazing. You guys are incredible. So you know what? Exactly. I hope when you, you're going to be getting a, send, be sent a request to, to review us. It's really important to us. And it, it, it would mean a lot to me personally, and I know it would mean a lot to Dr. Nash, if you would make a comment about how you were treated today and how how and how and um, well you were, you, you felt served. Uh, we had, an, um, I had a hygienist tell me just um, this morning that a new patient came to them because she did not like the way the hygienist treated her. She said she felt scolded. She felt um, ashamed. She felt embarrassed. She said, I like the, she said, I like the doctor just fine. And she says, but I did not like the way the hygienist treated me, and I'm not going back. Okay, one more thing before we move on to sincerity and presence. The last, I, we got through six out of eight with you. I that's know, like, doing really that, well. That, that's really good. Okay, tell the story real quick about the patient that called at four o'clock and said, I needed 20 crowns. And I right, tell that story, please. All right. So, um, yeah, patient called. I think her appointment was at three o'clock in the afternoon. And she said she would like to have a new smile. Um, in time for her her daughter's graduation. And this is three o'clock. It's 20 veneers. So, and this is in uh, Ross's this is in Ross's office, right? This is in Ross's office. This is in, right. yeah, and that's when he owned the practice. Tyler wasn't there yet. So it's three o'clock. She and she wants 20 veneers and she liked them in time for her daughter's high school graduation, which is in three weeks. So that means if we have to turn this case around in three weeks, we're gonna have to get started when? Now. Now. <laughs> uh, we should have gotten started. So we turned to the team and we said, you know, what do you want to do? And they said, we will stay. And, and um, it's a $42,000, dollars $44,000 case. Well, and so, they stayed, you said, till like 11 o'clock at night or something? It was 10.30. <laughs> Pardon me. And, and they knew that the patient was really fatigued. So they asked the patient's permission and they said, one of us will drive your car home for you. you and then the, and we'll have another assistant follow. So you don't have to drive home tonight because you've wow. been in the chair a long time. Yeah. So they drove her home. Now, how many patients for cosmetic and aesthetic dentistry do you think this patient has referred? I want to say eight. I think there have been eight, eight of her friends that they said, oh, my gosh, we love her teeth. We love her smile. And, and we it's, love her story. It's Rich Carlton's service. All right, Deborah, sincerity. Well, we've been talking a, little, a lot about this in terms of um, you have to you have to. Be, you have to authentically feel that what you're saying is true. So I'm not a big fan. I mean, I believe that there are certain things you can say, um, but but if it's done because you were told to say it, not because you believe it, then it's not sincere. And your patients are gonna they're gonna know. So, but you can you can also there's things you can avoid to really um, demonstrate sincerity. So when you say um, that's our policy, that is not sincere. Um, policy is not a sincere word. Nope. Uh, it, it's it's a rules and regulations. So when we want to demonstrate our sincerity, we don't say things like these are the rules of our of our practice. I was just looking at some forms that a software company has, and I said, "What is this page seven? What is all this? What are all these rules and regulations?" And and I said, "You've got to eliminate that. I mean, that is not the way you want to start a relationship with with the patient. You want to really sincerely care about them." which also you have, which goes into one of the other rules and that's give them the time that they deserve for the investment you're asking them to make. Exactly. Exactly. Is that okay. So the last rule, we made it to the last rule, Deborah, <laughs> last <laughs> rule, number, number eight is presence. What does yeah. that mean? That means, I mean, I, if I, when I'm with that patient, um, I have to give them the time. In fact, one of the things that I, that I always say, speaking of time, when patients are asking about fees and I always, I always will, if people say, well, you know, boy, that's a lot of money. And I'll say, I'd be happy to tell you how we determine our fees. Our fees are based on three things. 
the skill it the skill required to do it right the time it takes to do it well and the materials that we use the laboratories that we with, with whom we partner so that we know that your restorations will endure and that you'll be satisfied um, so what that also means we're going to take the appropriate amount of time and that also means we're going to take focused time with a patient and, and sincere, which means we're going to be sincere. We're not going to be jumping, um, especially with big cases. We can't be jumping up and down. So we have to schedule appropriately. And I would say we have to schedule sincerely. We have to schedule that this is an important part of this patient's life. And we have to sincerely give them the time that they deserve. Um, and I also think the, the um, and, and I'm going to steal this from my, I'm going to steal it because I'm married to the man. Um, Ross always, when he's talking to, to, to doctors and especially young doctors about dentistry, and he has, he has said this for years, he said, never diagnose to pay a bill, right? Yeah. It will, it will hurt you in the end. You will, you will regret that you took on the case. The patient will not be happy. Um, and it's going to be nothing but a nightmare. So never diagnose to pay a bill Diagnose because you want to do this. You want to, you want to, you want to take care of this. So you're not, so, so that would be also sincere treatment planning. I, I know I can do this. I know I can do this well, and I'm not going to, you know, one of the things that we always say to the patient, this is strictly elective. You, you don't have to do anything because the minute you say to the patient, you know what, this is totally elective. You don't have to do anything. However, there's a lot of solutions here and there are a lot of op options. Would you allow me to tell you what we could do? Always asking options, for permission. One of the options is to do nothing. And you can see the patient relax a minute. You say, you know what? You don't have to do anything. And the patient's receptivities, their receptors kind of open up and say, wait a minute. Well, you're not going to try and sell me. You're not going to try and convince me. You don't have to do anything. However, if you don't do something about this, this is what can occur or gaining their what, trust. I mean, yes. Yeah, so here's what we can do. And, and the, of course, the, one of the questions we have to always ask the patient is, you know, what questions can I answer for you? Tell me how you're feeling about, that's a sincere question as well. Tell me how you're feeling about your visit with us today. Yeah. 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 I well, let me, let, well, you know what? You are a treasure. I adore you. You're wonderful. Um, I wish you were closer. You're 3000 miles away, but I will I see know. you. I will see you the first week of May in Scottsdale, our Academy of Dental CPA meeting. I, you are going to present. I'm going to heckle you, by the way, just so you know, Thank um, you so when are you? And so I'm see you, you, and you didn't mention this, that you are now a member. Oh, of I am. A, yes. Network. I am now a member of the speaking and consulting network folks. And my friend Deborah will slap me for not saying this. I am so excited to be part of this organization. Deborah talked me into it and I'm excited. So if you are looking for a speaker, if you're looking for someone to speak about dental management, if you're a meeting planner or you have a study club, uh, there is no better speaker that I know of than Miss Nash or Mrs. Nash or Madam President or whatever your name is. OK, if you're um, looking at metrics and you're looking at transitions. Yeah. And you're looking yeah. At planning, yeah. So my yeah. And my subjects, my subjects, if you need a lecturer, folks, is uh, financial planning, taxes, accounting, um, uh, transitions, buying a practice, selling a practice, going into partnerships and metrics uh, of, a, of a dental practice. So I, I can speak on all that if you need someone. Uh, Deborah, you are giving your uh, case presentation course sometime here in the future, I think, I'm guessing. Well, I'm giving it a couple of times. Um, I'm giving it for... Um, uh, bulletproof dentist in Las Vegas. I'm doing yep. it in Fort Bend, Indiana, coming nice. up in April. That's really fast. I'm doing it in Fort Lauderdale in May. Yeah. Um, so, um, so go on to Deborah. You have your own website, right? I do. Deborah, just Google Deborah Deborah Engelhart Nash, and go go listen to her because her stuff is golden. It's stuff that you can take back. Ah, uh, thank you for coming on. This is just so much fun for me. That's I came in. Fun. tell you we we just have fun i can't wait to see you i will see you twice at least this year i'll see you in in may and in, in scottsdale and i'll see you in nashville i've never been in nashville uh you don't want to see me dance so i i don't know we'll see we'll talk about well, it nashville is a very very fun town but it's an absolutely very robust meeting i have to say one other thing i think that you know one of my my pieces of advice 
know, if you say, Deborah, what would you want to leave them with? First of all, always ask permission before you present your treatment, get their permission and do it. But I think the other, the other piece is I go into so many dental offices and I watch opportunities get missed. I, w- I watch so many opportunities go by. And it's also, it's because they're not being, they're not intentionally looking. They're, they have, they're creating their own, they're putting their own blinders on. They're creating biases. Um, so I think that it's important to, you know, go in with an unbiased eye, with a caring, sincere eye that there is no bias. Um, and if the patient two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, said they didn't want to do it and they can't afford it, doesn't mean that they're not ready now. So never assume the patient. So that would be the other thing. Never assume the patient doesn't want it. And that happens so many times. We sometimes defeat ourselves because we assume the patient isn't yep. interested, they can't afford it, and they don't want it. And we approach the whole treatment presentation and the whole consultation with that bias. And that goes back to what does that do? It kills our enthusiasm. If you invest time and money in yourself and your team in learning how to communicate with your patients, your practice will grow, your case acceptance percentage will go up, you will be happier, you will have happier, healthier patients, healthier patients. Doctors, I can't emphasize this enough. Deborah, hang with me as I take the podcast out. Okay. Thank you so much. I seriously, pleasure. you Always are a you are golden. Um, so, uh, folks, do not forget to go to our dear, dear partners, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, www.decisionsindentistry.com. They have 140 continuing education courses at an incredible price. Um, very, very reasonable price for their CE courses. Go to their website, the best clinical content on the planet. There is no better, www.decisionsanddentistry.com. My mothership, which I helped form 22 years ago, is the Academy of Dental CPAs, www.adcpa.org. 25 wonderful CPA firms, of which Ied Bailey is uh, one of them. That represents over 10,000 dentists, www.adcpa.org. If you are looking for a dental CPA, we do that work at Ide Bailey. That is what we do. Uh, We work with over 1,000 dentists in our offices, about 300 plus in our office in Southern California. My partners, Don and Pam, are fantastic, wonderful people. In order to be a partner in our office, you have to have a three-letter name. It's either Art, Pam, or Don. And then Sam is our tax manager, so he has three letters. It's just required, I guess. But anyway, my phone number is 657-279-3243 or send me an email at A Wiederman, W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at Ide Bailey, E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y.com. Come see me at booth 1472 at the California Dental Convention, uh, third week in May. Make sure you, if you're in Northern California and you're an up-and-coming dentist and you want to figure out what you want to be when you grow up, Go to cda.org and register for our courses June 10th in the San Francisco Bay Area and June 22nd in Sacramento. And with that, I, uh, I'm i exhausted. Again, I'm exhausted, but it is so much fun to talk to Miss Deborah. Mrs. Deborah Engelhart nash the incoming president, Academy of Private Dental Practice. And with that, everyone, I will say thank you for the honor and privilege of your time. Uh, This is Art Wiederman for the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman CPA, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. The Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast is produced by Ide Bailey in partnership with Art Wiederman, CPA, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, and the Academy of Dental CPAs. For audience questions and feedback, email Art Wiederman, awiederman at idbailey.com. That's A-W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com. Or you may call Art at 657-279-3243.